have to tell you, this is not my 15 minutes, okay? I'm going to be doing that in a bit. But uh, I, uh, I just came out to welcome you all. So I've never done a 5 by 15 uh, before. And apparently there's people going to be timing and everything. I have warned them I will be ignoring that. But anyway, <laughs> my wife. My wife is such a dyke. She has referred all week to your 4 by 4 that's coming up. Um, <laughs> I said, oh, darling, that's a car that you need to get around that tricky corner at Sloan Square. That is not a thing, it's a fundraising thing. Uh, but fundamentally, I think I'm in charge this evening, and I'm fine with that. I am fine with that, because you know what? I am 57 years old, and I realize that I know a thing or two. And the first thing... <laughs> I know is that I look fabulous. Seriously. Yes. And I wish I'd had the courage to know that when I was young enough to actually look fabulous. But there we are. Uh, second thing that I pass on, a little piece of advice uh, that I'd like to give everybody. Uh, it's something I've learned. I don't know, maybe some of you are still thinking about having children. Just a little tiny piece of advice. Uh, never have more children than you have car windows. There you are, they're just passing that on. <laughs> it's about the only thing I've learned. Uh, number three, three things. One, I look fabulous. Two, about the children in the car. Number three, if you wish to challenge your mental stability, and who of us has not had that as a rising thought of a morning, start a political party on a whim <laughs> would be the way to do it. So, there's a Danish expression I want to teach you, and uh, it's, uh, it's, this is the expression, it's de tade vid uda oin, okay? And what it means is it takes the whites out of your eyes. <laughs> you, are, you are so shocked by something that your pupils go like that. And I have had that on a daily basis with trying to start a political party. Uh, why are we here? We're here to raise money. Okay, so the political parties that exist, uh, the Tories are funded by, primarily by business, uh, Labour Party by the unions, and we are funded by you. Yes, you. What's your name? Fran. Fran! Yay! Let's hear it for Fran. Fran! Okay. I'm thrilled to be here. I, it was, I don't know if you know this, it was supposed to be at the Royal Geographical Society. I hate that place, I can never bloody find it. And um, <laughs> take your time, seriously, it's uh... <laughs> The Methodist Central Hall tonight, there is Methodist in our madness, which I like. <laughs> and I wondered how many religious jokes are done on this stage. Not that many, I would imagine. So. Jesus goes into a restaurant <laughs> with his disciples. He said, I'd like a table for 26, please. And the major says, there's only 13 of you. He says, yes, we all like to sit on the same side. Um, <laughs> I like that, it's clever, requires art, history, knowledge, it's good. <laughs> Here's one that doesn't. Um, Nun goes in to see the Mother Superior. She says, Mother Superior, we've discovered a case of syphilis. Mother Superior says, oh, thank God for that. I was getting tired of the shabli. But there we are. Um, <laughs> I'm not really sure what goes on in here. I have to be honest with you. I've had a look on their website, which I really enjoyed. Um, well, I've not been sleeping well. And uh, currently looking forward to the Daffodil Day Rally in March. Quite Nuremberg sound to it. Um, I have no idea. Not helped by the fact that last year's theme was flowers. Really? That was a stretch. To... Let's have a crazy Daffodil Day rally. Let's uh, celebrate nasturtiums. I have no idea what happened. Um, did you know that in this room, the UN General Assembly met for the very first time in 1946? Do you not think that's a fantastic thing? In this very room, and do you know who was the person that caused the UN to be founded in the first place? It was Eleanor Roosevelt. She is one of the great unsung heroes of women's history. Uh, she was the very, yeah, a round of applause for Eleanor, she's fantastic. <laughs> She was the very first chair of the UN Commission on Human Rights. She oversaw the drafting of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. 70 years we've had the UN. There has never been a woman secretary general. So each geographical region takes a turn, and weirdly, women have never, ever had a turn. 
2016, a new United Nations Secretary General will be selected behind closed doors. We have no idea what the criteria will be. Uh, if you want to write letters, do, because it's shocking. It's absolutely shocking. Um, I love this. 1995, the UN had their fourth World Conference on Women. So four, that's quite a lot, right? That's quite a lot of conferences. You must have been quite close to making a decision. Um, <laughs> Are we in, out, where are we? 90, uh, 189 governments uh, turned up, and the year 2000 was set as the target date for overall gender equality. <laughs> Anybody else here tumbleweed? Is it just me? Is it... Yeah, but there are more important things. Men are busy. Um... <laughs> oh, stop bothering me, dear. One day, yes, all right. Um... Uh, the website mentions lots of the great men who have spoken in this very hall. Gandhi, Martin Luther King, Winston Churchill. There is not one woman mentioned because, on the whole, we're so mute. Um, but tonight, tonight, a selection of fabulous women, and we are all going to do our best to entertain you and try and stop our menstrual cycles from colliding. Um, <laughs> please welcome! A force of nature, a woman I am proud to call my friend, a woman with enough opinions to sink a battleship, it's Catelyn Moran. I'm supposed to be timing this. I'll have to talk quickly. Um, I am thrilled to be st sharing a stage with such a gigantic organ. <laughs> feel like I'm standing next to Michael Fassbender. Um, <laughs> when I was a child, I knew evidentially that I was at a disadvantage by being born a girl. The 1970s fading into the 1980s, when marital rape was still legal. You could fire a woman for being pregnant. Benny Hill chased schoolgirls in suspenders around the park every Saturday night, and yet, ironically, women weren't allowed to compete in marathons. <laughs> and the idea of a woman playing football, being a surgeon, practicing law, being a politician, directing a film, or being a lesbian was still very much regarded as a weird fringe activity that society would do pretty much everything it could to make difficult, embarrassing, and just that little bit emotionally damaging if you were really stubborn and persisted in pursuing it. I would like to say that those were the issues I was most burningly obsessed with at the age of 13. I'd like to claim that my feminism was immediate, instinctive, analytical, and hardcore. If I am to be truthful, however, I must admit that in 1988, the women's issues that concerned me most were, one, how to make my hair grow vertically out of my head, <laughs> like the cast of Dynasty in Dallas, and two, whether it was normal to have one breast so very much larger than the other, <laughs> as mine very much looked like the two Ronnies. <laughs> the thing most concerning me, however, was how boring it seemed to be a woman. All the information I had to hand, from TV, books, magazines and films, told me that we never did anything except watch boys do things. We were never bitten by radioactive spiders, or discovered that we had the force, or wrote please please me, or went to the moon, or conquered a land, or founded a religion. We didn't get to hang out with the boys. We had to remain ghettoized with the other women. We were not in their gangs or in their rockets, and we were never, ever David Bowie. <laughs> when I was 13, I thought that this was the worst part about being a woman, that we had done so very little, that we had nothing to boast about, no stories to tell, that we were relegated to a woman's area with other women to woman around, womanishly. <laughs> now I'm 40, I know that that's the best thing. For whilst we are still disadvantaged in so many ways, women in the 21st century have the greatest advantage of all. We are on a mission. We have a purpose. We are part of a new narrative. Whilst we might broadly surmise that we know what men are now, because we are surrounded by their stories and their histories, their achievements and their heroes, we still do not yet know 
what women are. Now we have a little more breathing room, as we're not being burnt as witches anymore. <laughs> this is an era unprecedented by the amount of women finally being able to ask that question. What are we? Are we different to men? Would we, if we started anew from scratch, make this world in a different way? Do we have a different language, a different understanding of the world, a different vision of the future? What will our future be? What will be the future of our daughters? What would women be if we were not brought up from the moment we were born with a million tiny insidious prompts telling us what we should not be or what we should be? We should be quiet, smooth, small, hairless, nurturing, supportive and compliant. We do not hear our own strong, kick-ass, rebellious inner voices cheering us on. Too often, a woman's inner voice is a horrible, carping, dolorous thing, like a sad and manky crow. <laughs> Our inner voice, if we listen to it, is actually the voice of bullies at school, or a bad mother, or a bad boyfriend that is telling us, you're fat, you are failing, you can't do this. Imagine if those were not our inner voices. Imagine if we had someone positive inside us. Imagine if every woman's inner voice was Oprah Winfrey or Lorraine Kelly. <laughs> Darling, you're doing so well today. You absolutely must treat yourself to a nap. You can't do everything at once. You absolutely should wear that mad silver cape and invent a sex robot. <laughs> you are a powerful and brilliant woman. I think most of us have, at some point in our lives, felt that we are not normal. That we have the wrong bodies, or that we think the wrong way, or that the way we speak is not suitable for the place we are in, or that to express our thoughts would lead to people laughing unkindly or simply dismissing us out of hand. I suspect we have all worried at some point that we take up too much space. We hunch over, we cross our legs, we walk quickly and hurriedly down streets, saying sorry, 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 over and over again. We make self-deprecating comments all the time to make ourselves smaller. We restrict what we eat to make ourselves smaller. Sometimes we take medication or drink to make ourselves smaller, like a sad Alice in Wonderland drinking her potion to shrink. We take these things to make our emotions smaller, to make our demands smaller, to make our desperation smaller, and ultimately to make our power smaller. And that is not a natural thing. That is not an innate masochism, as I have been told before, in women. Women were not born to be lesser or smaller. This isn't how the Big Bang was supposed to play out. This isn't physics. It is instead part of a 4,000 year history of women being forced to be smaller. I hope very much that you got to see the recent documentary series, The Ascent of Woman, written by Dr. Amanda Foreman. I believe it to be simply one of the most astonishing and revolutionary shows of the last 10 years. Because here, in forensic global detail, Dr. Foreman showed us the untold history of women. The sad and enraging history of women for, once, it seems, women were equal to men. They must have been, because as she showed, some unknown cultural shift 4,000 years ago seemed to provoke a fury against women across the world. Dr. Foreman showed us the first ever anti-female rules being created in 2340 BC in Sumeria, which started to curtail women for the first time. How they must not now speak in public against a man, or they would have their teeth smashed in with a brick, how they must cover themselves, how they could now be owned. You could see prejudice and misogyny being assembled piece by piece, rule by rule, precedent by precedent. And however distressing and enraging it was to watch this program, to see a trail of female destruction being wrought over 4,000 years, the misery, waste and stupidity of this, it was also oddly liberating, because it proved that men and women were not born into this unequal relationship. This isn't nature at work. Men did not inherit the earth. 
Instead, we have the dates and times when women were made unequal. These were decisions. These were social constructs, and they were just ideas. And once you know that, you are, oddly, free. Because if an idea, an idea that women should be second-class citizens, should be owned, should be silenced, can become so powerful that it dictates history for the next 4,000 years, then another idea can come along and replace it, just as totally, just as forcibly, and just as revolutionarily. And that is what I mean by women's disadvantage being perversely an advantage, because we are that idea. Every woman in the room now doing a million things that would have been impossible 200 years ago, 100 years ago, 50 years ago, having an education, having a profession, having control of her fertility, having ownership with herself, being able to connect with other women and form networks of power, to be able to share information with any other woman in the world, to own property, to educate her children, to be able to write an enormously long blog post about how much she fancies Benedict Cumberbatch, <laughs> and to not be stoned to death for doing so. Each of these advancements were built piece by piece also, with legislation and laws women like you and me conceived of, campaigned for, and won. Every woman in here is an incremental undoing of a wrong, and we can be the incremental undoing of a million more. We can advance the next generation. We can live with the idea, we can live the idea of female power, progress, advancement, and normality. Because that is the key thing in the decades to come. Normality. Powerful women being normal. We have so many brilliant, inspiring female pioneers out there. But what you notice over time is that they remain just that. Trailblazers. Pioneers. They tend not to be the first wave of an onslaught of women. Instead, they rocket up the ranks, trailing sparks, and then, more often than not, they remain on their own. They continue being surrounded by men without a team or a den mother to cheer them on. They are the sole heels in a room full of brogues. They are loaded with all the wearisomeness of being a novelty. And they are furious and exhausted from having to explain to men what other women have known all along. And that's why something like this is so important, why this party is so important. Women being together, being used to being in a room together, looking each other in the eye and going, although I may disagree with you on who the most fanciable member of One Direction is, it is clearly Harry Styles. Please stop with your Zayn madness. <laughs> we have the ability to do something astonishing and permanent together. As a young feminist, I'm ashamed to say I did not believe this. I didn't believe in the power of female networks. I'm treated equally by men and women, I thought. I'm not weak. I don't need the patronage of women. Then I got to 30 with two children and noticed something, that however much I had been praised and appreciated by men, every time I'd actually been promoted, it was without exception by a woman. And a woman who had ignored my womanly protests of, I don't think I'm ready. I can't handle this. And who had replied, balls, of course you can. I'm going to give you power now, and don't you dare let me down. And I realized that however much I believed, and I really did want to believe that men treat women equally, they don't, because they can't. And it's not through spite or misogyny or hatred or wrong, because I had been born up by a million brilliant women who had seen something in me that men would simply not have looked for. The women had seen that I would be useful to other women, and that is something that is simply impossible for a man to see, because he will not know what has not yet been done. He doesn't know this mad hunger in us to change the world. He doesn't know the things we dream, the things we crave, the things we're starred of, how bored we are, how ignored we are, how we sit there with our wages going, I cannot find a film or a dress or a holiday or a hero or a politician that I love. In a neoliberal market economy democracy driven by novelty and innovation, why have they still not invented more dresses with sleeves? My upper arms are essentially an internal organ. I do not believe they should be subject to the human gaze. <laughs> that is why I am a founding member of the Women's Equality Party, and that is why I'm here today, even though there's a repeat of that episode of Don't Tell the Bride, where he makes a jump out of a plane. 
I do this because I want one day for all women to feel normal. That's all we want. We don't want to be superheroes or pioneers because those are unreasonable, exhausting things. We just want to be normal. We want to be, and this is the ultimate aim of feminism, I don't know if you knew, to be as dim, fat, deluded, average, happy, secure, and relaxed as men. <laughs> True equality is the day that our daughters are handed the half of wor the world, and it is only half of the world, not the whole world, just the half of the world that is theirs, at birth, and they need say nothing more than, thank you, I will enjoy my life. I will pursue my joy, and I will attend the three strict rules of feminism. One, all people are equal. All people are equal. Two, don't be a dick. <laughs> And three, there is no third rule. The above comprehensively cover everything you need to know. <laughs> Thanks very much. <laughs>